Hey there, podcast listeners. Death Becomes the JJ Meets World podcast this week. Alex Rydell is our guest. He is a professional mortician, funeral director, and undertaker. You're going to find out all about what it takes Af- takes place after somebody dies. This is a very interesting episode, and I feel like it's something that if you want to get your parents into listening to this podcast, this might be a great introductory one. So sit back, relax, and enjoy JJ Meets World with our special guest, Alex Rydell. One, two, three, four. <laughs> J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is! He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. I find it easier to remember things that happened in my life that were not special on any day, that just became a special day because of an event that took place. One small change that turned the day into a lifelong memory versus days where it's been like, this is going to be a memory, this is going to be huge, and it gets built up for so long and then doesn't become anything. For example... I remember only one thing about my dad's funeral, and this is it. I don't remember who spoke. I don't remember really the songs. I don't remember where we stood, where we waited. But I do remember walking between the First Presbyterian Church in downtown Fargo and the old Avalon building in downtown where we had the reception and some douchebag driving by blaring the song, She Blinded Me With Science. And so he drives by, and there's hundreds of people walking in between these things. And then he goes around the corner, and then he comes around again. And then the third time that this guy came around, my buddy Phil Lund ran out into the middle of the street. The car screeches to a halt. It's still blaring. She blinded me with science. And he slams both of his hands down on the hood of the car, and he goes, My friend's dad just died. Get the hell out of here. And... It had nothing to do really with the funeral. It had nothing to do with you know anything. I don't. It just it was this amazingly funny moment that cut the tension, like no tomorrow. I can remember driving out to a development called Martin's Way with a girl named Katie Spath, and she taught me everything that I know about constellations in one night. And she you know pointed at certain things and. I remember driving into Martin's Way and all it was was a gate and there's a big gate that said Martin's Way and now it's full of homes. You couldn't go out there and see the stars anymore. There's too many lights. There are certain just moments that you think you're supposed to remember this for the rest of your life, but the things you actually end up remembering that mean more are those things that are totally inconsequential. Is it, is there something about that? Is that is that something that people should should note is that when we put pressure on an event to be memorable, it, we're taking away from it or should we just rejoice and appreciate those small moments even more? Here's another example. I made a movie with you down in Rutland, North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Uh that was a black and white it was a Radiohead music video, yeah, I believe. Yeah. This was in my super angsty, I just graduated from high school phase. Mm-hmm. Super angsty. Super angsty. I don't remember anything about that. About uh, like making it? About making it. I don't remember anything about the music video itself. But what I do remember is late that night, our friend getting so, 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 <laughs> so inebriated <laughs> that he thought the MacBook that was had a, like a pulsating light on it was breathing and then he built a crown of thorns and put it on a teddy bear but they were the tines of a four he also threatened to stab all of us while we slept mm-hmm. i remember that, that was vividly f- i do too <laughs> it's and hard so, to forget that one do you ever i mean and maybe it's because your mind is already so swept up in what's taking place in the moment mm-hmm. 
when you're doing these things like a wedding or a brisk. They say like on a wedding day, blink and, you know, it's going to disappear. And yet we're putting, you know, a huge amount of money into it and we are concentrating on these things. But there are people who these important moments are part of their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So think of the person who plans a wedding. Think about the person whose sole job it is to uh, to mop up the church before you show up for your baby's christening or yeah. baptism or bris. Yeah, no, no matter how you try to curate a life moment or experience, um, life is going to drive itself at a pace that you're not in control of. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the guy blaring the music, right? Like, uh, that was not planned for the day, right? You probably couldn't have made a plan to not let that happen. Life is going to kick down the door at some way and throw some wrench into your plans. And that's something that we should embrace because it's going to happen. We can't pretend like it's not going to happen. So maybe that has something to do with it. It was the one part of the day that wasn't planned that way. It yeah. was the one thing that it was the surprise. It was the surprise that uh, that that punctuated it, and it was a good character moment for Phil. Yeah, being a good guy for once. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I love you. Uh, we'll have to get Phil on the podcast at <laughs> some point, but I could I could do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is somebody who sees those surprises every single day and is a part of your life when you. It, is it has been a part of the emotional moment of so many people's lives. You probably have that one family member who you've never seen cry, but this guy has seen that person cry. Uh, Alex Rydell is an undertaker, a mortician, and a funeral director. It just is the evolution of his title uh, over the years. And I think you guys are really going to dig this podcast because uh, I make mention at one point of uh, in an old saying from India about death because no one escapes death. Death is not a stranger to any of us. And I'm not talking about the fact that you listener or myself or Tucker are going to die one day, but that everybody we know is going to die one day. You've been affected by death in one way, shape or form your whole life. And rather than it being this great mystery there are people who are involved with it that you may not know. How many people who have ever planned a funeral have relied heavily on the funeral director or the people who've cared for your loved one after the, uh, the, the, the synapses have shut down in their brain and their heart has ceased to beat anymore. Alex also makes great mention of the fact that he loves what he does because he's there for a community. Yeah. Um, he provides, he, he, what does he say? He provides a service to the living yep. by taking care of the dead. Yeah. And uh, it, that's the, the role of a funeral director is how often do you think a family comes up to him and says, hey, thank you so much, right? Like, the, it's, I'm sure it's not expected, um, but that, that person has, is doing a fantastic job fantastic, difficult, painful, stressful, heartbreaking uh, service for you um, so that you can get through this very difficult time in your life. That's incredibly important. Thank your undertaker, everybody. Yeah. Make sure to thank your undertaker and tip your waitresses. <laughs> um, let's get right into this. Alex Rydell on JJ Meets World. Uh, you guys are going to learn a lot about death and the business of death and the history of death, and nothing about the character of death. If you want that, you should watch uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 1. JJ Meets World! Alex, how are you? Hello, JJ. I am, I am well, thank you. Let's kick this thing off right away, huh? Tell people okay. who you are, how we found you, and uh, I'll take it from there. How's well, that sound? That's, uh, that sounds good. Um... Well, my name is Alex Rydell, um, and I am a, uh, I guess by job profession, my, my, my profession is I'm a, a funeral director or a mortician or an undertaker. Um, and, so you're uh, a wrestler. I'm a, I'm a wrestler. Yep. Yeah, a professional wrestler. <laughs> uh, you know, 
Um, no, and then, uh, you know, I guess how I ended up here, I think, is probably Tucker. Uh, Tucker and I grew up together doing a lot of different things. Singing, as you were yep. uh, had mentioned. Uh, we sang in high school uh, together, and... Um, I'm guessing that's how you found me. Yeah, that's how we found you. Well, was, probably in I your reached, phone reached on into Facebook. My pa- in, my, in my past. Yeah. I almost said my pants. I know. I heard <laughs> well, I heard you. you could, like, I was trying to say hesitate. past, and then I said pants. Mm-hmm. No, I went, on, my I, pants. I went on Facebook, uh, and it, this was actually early on when we were first starting the podcast. And I was like, who are some people in town that I know would be really interesting to listen to? <laughs> and you were one of them, because I remember it's funny. you in high school, and you were... Just this like sarcastic, awkward, awkward, <clears throat> but hyper talented dude who was really funny. And the <laughs> fact that you know, I think we all kind of assumed back in high school that, well, Alex is going to be a, a, a professional violinist, which he is. But we thought like it was like, oh, that is his identity. Yep. And then you just really took this really interesting. I shot in a different direction. You shot it, you took a different direction, but a very interesting direction into your profession. And yeah. now you're wearing a golf polo. You're drinking out of a Yeti cup. <laughs> Uh, did you expect uh, that, Tucker? Uh-uh, nope. 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 Uh, okay, so Alex, you said undertaker, <laughs> mortician, and funeral director. Those all can't be the same thing, right? The same thing. Are they really? They the name the name has uh, the name and the title for what I do has evolved through the through the years. Um, starting as undertaker, and you know it. I don't know people. For many different reasons, but I mean, it started out as 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 an undertaker. That was the name of it because that literally that's what we do. You know, it's an undertaking. You're undertaking this ma- this task of caring for the dead, and so that was the most fitting name for that that job that that people were doing. You know, it was an undertaking that was was uh, was undertaken by oftentimes back in the day. It was by family. By family and by the community, there wasn't an undertaker, one person, but it evolved through time and and uh, and became something that somebody said, "Well, we could specialize in this." You know, this is uh, you know the human population grew and it was it was there's a need for it. So, it, um, but then it evolved. You know, I suppose people found the undertaker name to be uh, uh, less than desirable, perhaps for one reason or another and so they decided to call him us a, a mortician and then uh and then it led into funeral director which was soft and you know warm mm-hmm. and, and and it's okay because that's that is uh very much what we do we we direct funerals um but i i don't know i just I, i'm kind of old school i love the term undertaker because it is it's a it, it expresses the gravity of the job you know um, what's the next evolution like post life specialist <laughs> yes exactly you know? yes end of yeah post life yeah it, that's true because it's not end of life it's after the end of life mm-hmm. you know uh, yeah post life caregiver yeah the, the term mortician when I think of that one and I break that try to break it down it really just sounds like someone who applies makeup to a dead body because mm-hmm. beautician and mortality I'm here I'm hearing both those words in that oh, yeah. word so that that word sounds like a weird one to go to from undertaker it almost sounds like the position is being lessened by the word choice right yeah and and, and you know now that I think about it as we talk about it the there's this funny thing when I was an intern so you have to serve in most states anyway um, you have to serve an internship. Um, as part of your your training an uh, internment so, internship, I was going to say like yeah. an internment <laughs> ship. Yes. Oh, an intern- I thinking, <laughs> this is going to be the punniest pun- <laughs> podcast we've had. I'm sorry, keep oh, going. No, that's fine. But so anyway, so in North Dakota, <clears throat> uh, North Dakota has every state has its unique regulations and things, and the the technical term for the intern when you're serving your internship is you are an intern embalmer Mm, that is what your title is you're not an intern funeral director which just dates back and it just never has changed you know uh but it's a funny thing because it's such a small part of our job i mean it is certainly a part of our job embalming um but it's a small part we're you know we're doing it's a multifaceted uh job profession so i i'm sure other people have told you this before but 
uh, the odds of you having cared for my mother after her passing are pretty good when Tucker told me the place you live or you live work at, at. Work at. It feels like you live there, I'm sure, from time to time. It does, yes. And um, I imagine that that, because you're interacting with families mm-hmm. at probably the most vulnerable stage they've been at because either they've had a long time to prep for this death, but it still comes unexpectedly. Right. You, how many people have ever said, I had all this time and I didn't say everything I wanted to say, or it's sudden and it's it must be it must be hard to to shrug that off at the end of the day because there's a lot of sadness while at the same time there's a lot of celebration in death. Absolutely. Um you know that's that's interesting. Yeah, it you know, we are with uh we are spending time with people in their what is can arguably be the the worst absolute worst times in their lives you know they've lost someone they loved whether it be tragically or uh planned or not but it's still even when they're 95 years old it's uh it's sad it's it can be devastating you know and so we're in this um intensely emotional and raw these situations with families and we're we're walking with them, and be, and and if we're doing our jobs well, um, we're we're empathetic and we're feeling that with the families because that's how we, that's how we appropriately and and properly I think, um, help them through the process and help uh, help create these meaningful experiences is by being empathetic and f- which by definition you're feeling something with a person, um, and so. So to do that on a daily basis, um, which some days are, are, you know, more intense than others, of course, but, um, to do it on a daily basis and then, and then come home and try and sit at the dinner table and have, you know, much, much more superficial conversations sometimes. Um, yeah, it's a really weird situation to be in. And I've, I've struggled with that. I've done this for, I've been a, uh, a funeral director for 11 years now. Um, and it's ebbed and flowed in my life, but um, it has it has been really interesting to. I've had to do a lot of soul searching in in finding okay, where is the balance, and how can I, um, how can I act and do the best job possible for the families I'm working with at work, and then still show up at home in my relationships at home and be have the have the capacity still to be vulnerable and open and empathetic and and raw with my family. I imagine your family has trained themselves not to say anything interesting happened at work today. Yeah. When well, you're around the dinner table? Sometimes, but you know, sometimes it is there's certainly interesting things and and we like like anyone need to need to have that outlet for talking about work. You know, so um so a lot of times it's we we still talk about it, but it's uh, probably filtered, you know, more than more so than people in other professions, maybe. I so get, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, because I'm going to take this in a weird twist. So okay, you yeah. fi- you follow up with what you need. Yeah, I was just going to say I can actually give testimony to Alex as a undertaker or as a funeral director. Oh yeah, because when our good friend Matthew Burkholder passed away, uh, Alex Alex yeah. took care of Matthew um, for us, and there was this really beautiful moment. The day before, I think it was the day before the service we had, maybe it was the day of, um, where we're all prepping in this theater space and we're all very sad and we're all very sweaty and gross because we've been like getting all this done and we're all emotionally drained. And we had this like photo of Matthew set up on like a stand with some flowers there and stuff. And um, Brad goes, hey guys, Matt is here. And we knew what that meant. And then we all just turned around and Alex came walking in with the urn that Matthew was in. And Alex was dressed very, you know, like professionally and he looked very buttoned up. And even when he walked in, like you could tell this person could sense the what the this this moment meant, right? This is our first time interacting with our friend after he had died. And um and it was very beautiful and it was very well done. And I don't even know if Alex said anything. You may have said something like polite, like, hey, everyone, or something like that, but you he didn't there was no like, you know, we we know people who, when they're in a situation like that, even if they're professionals, might showboat or might kind mm-hmm. of soak up the energy of what's going on in that room and take it in a wrong direction. And Alex was uh, 
completely professional and it was exactly what we needed at that moment. Mm-hmm. It was it was a very sacred thing that he did when he brought our friend in. Mm-hmm. So I want to yeah, thank you for that. That, yeah. that was very yeah, special. Absolutely. I find it interesting how everyone has sort of a different way of talking about a uh, human being's remains. Um, I was at a funeral home once for a friend of mine who died in a train accident. And I remember getting a call from the funeral home saying, we picked up Jared today. And I remember thinking like, you picked up, oh, you mean his body. But no, they treated him still as, it's still this person. And that was the first time someone had ever referred to someone who had passed in a tense that still has ownership of the person. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be, it stuck with me for a long time. Um, So this is, this is one of the things I wanted to ask about. So we're going to get deep into funerals and the, the business of, of death. Um, So first and foremost, why did we start embalming bodies and why do we continue to embalm bodies? Good question. Thank uh, you. I've been thinking about that one. Yeah. Uh, so what happened was um, the, as, as far as society goes, um, we learned early on that, you know, I, I, uh, a gentleman um, named Thomas Lynch, who's a, uh, a well-known well-known funeral director uh, as well as poet, um, he 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 has this great way of talking about uh, the kind of the beginning of time and how uh, you know if you think if, you know think back to the first cavemen or if you will or the you know husband and wife cavemen and and uh, the husband. Uh, you know, she, they have no experience of life other than the two of them. So I, I guess if you're talking about Adam and Eve or, or just two, you know, hairy cavemen in the woods, you know, whatever. But anyway, so there's two people here. One of them, you know, uh, suddenly is laying there and he hasn't, you know, he hasn't, doesn't seem to have breathed in a while. And, and uh, you know, she's, she's experiencing death for the first time ever. And he's getting cold and, and then he starts to, starts to smell. Uh, a little bit his body starts to smell and and she's thinking well something's you know not right obviously he's he's not in this his spirit isn't in this body or what have you and so um you know well i suppose i should dig a hole to to put his body in so that the animals don't get it and so digs a hole for him and then well i'm going to build a build a pile of rocks so i remember where where it was that i buried his body you know um, and so he he uses that story to uh, to kind of illustrate like the very first um, and kind of the evolution of you know a cemetery and a and a monument kind of thing. Uh, as far as embalming goes, um, it you know it got to a point, and I'm not a history buff, so I'm not going to be able to give you dates and specific people that good, have done this kind of thing. Them. That's this good. isn't a test. That's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I was a little worried about that, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm really not, you know, like a genius or anything. But, but it, came, it came to a point where, um, you know, p- either people were, were scattered about, but in, in, the, in its core and its root, um, we, we always, we understood that, or people understood the value of being able to have that time with the person, um, that person's body before they're buried. And, um, and so it became, it became something, well, we can close their mouth. We can close their eyes. And then they, they, they created the embalming process so that it wasn't something where this has to happen like now, like right. in the next two days, mm-hmm. because pr- things are going to go awry. Yep. Things are going to go awry, start happening. Na- nature is going to happen, and we're going to need to bury the body soon. Well, if you do this, and it's it, you know we talk about it as preservation, it's it's embalming is a means of disinfecting, uh, preserving, and um, and then just presenting the you know appearance, bringing the appearance back. But it's it's slowing down decomposition. Doesn't stop it. It just slows the whole process down, um, and it it gives us a way to um, to experience that. And you know, especially nowadays, I mean, people. Um, people live all over the place, and so um, it, it it is a 
it's ultimately uh, oftentimes, more often than not, a healing experience for people to be able to have that time with um, with their loved one's body or friend or whoever it was um, to be able to, it's not just to say goodbyes or to be able to, um, you know, be able to pay their respects, if you will. It's a human, uh, it's the realization that they're gone. You know, being able to see the tangible, um, see the body not breathing, you know, um, I mean, if you think, I, I always think back to a kid, a child, and how would a child process this? You know, you think about our, our primal, you know, I, I think about my son is six and a half. Like, how would he process this if, if say, my grandmother dies, who's, you know, who's 90, 91. Um, so say she dies and uh, is cremated, which she won't be cremated, but if she were, She's cremated, and that, and I, 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 I will say right now that I don't have anything against cremation, but I'm just talking through that pro- the the thought mm-hmm. process. Um, <clears throat> so then he he shows up to the funeral or to the memorial service, and I tell him, "Well, great grandma is in that jar up there," um, and I've told him that she died. You know, I've explained that to him. But you got to think about our, you know, his, the, the thought process in his mind. I always think back to that. And I think, I think that's in all of us. I think that stays in all of us, that need for a tangible realization that, okay, that person is, is gone. Um, now, you know, that, that begins the, you know, the process for me of, uh, you know, the realization and now I can grieve and I can mourn and have those feelings, um, so uh, that I guess that was kind of that drifted a little, no, a few different directions. But um, you know, as far away, as embalming, away. yeah, embalming goes. That's. Uh, but I, yeah. I guess my question is, we have modern refrigeration processes oh, yeah. now. So why still continue to embalm? It's rather the best than, way. It just is. It's still the best way. I mean, we we yeah, we have a a, a cooler and a refrigerator, but. Um, but that can only hold so long. I mean, you you know, you, we're not having viewings in a in a refrigerator. You know, um, the it's still the best way to to bring color back to to bring back a natural appearance for someone. Um, and just and you know, we're not trying to make someone look like a supermodel or try and you know doll them up so they're all made up and and uh, looking fancy and things like that. We're just trying to give give them back to their family to to be able to have that time, their family and friends. Um, you know, to have that healing time of, of, uh, of viewing and spending time with their, you know, their body. So um, we're not trying to, to create something that it's not, but it's just the best way that we still have been able to do it. And it's evolved, certainly, but at, at its core, it's still the same process. And so do people often uh, put together a funeral plan that they share with their families? Or are they just trusting that they know what they want and then they come in they said okay so what's the difference between uh i would call it a regular burial or a cremation Mm -hmm. um you know do people ever come in there blind and just say like well let me explain the process of both of these things and what are what are my options for aunt ethel for sure and and people you know there's there's many different i think just with media nowadays there's so many different outlets and and people get fixated on certain ideas, and so um, a lot of people are uh, pre-planning, and that's why you'll see a lot of um, a lot of our kind of marketing, if you will, is geared towards pre-planning because it's not it's not so much trying to you know get as much business as we can. It's more about we have seen the value of pre-planning, coming in and pre-planning your service. Um, and so we want to make sure that people are thinking about it and talking about it because when it doesn't happen, it can oftentimes lead to uh, just general dismay because people don't know what, the, you know, they're trying to piece together. Well, I, I think they might have wanted this, uh, but we never talked about it. So I have no idea. And then you have the, you know, you're making a, a decision that's final. It's not, you can't change the decision. We can't. 
uh, we can't do redo a funeral. We can't redo a or undo a cremation. Um, and so you, you, it's it's a it's a, a choice that you're living with, you know, for the rest of your life. And uh, and so you know, what a better way of of at least at the very least putting down your wishes, um, and and um, and having that be known with your family and friends. So that's kind of why we we try and. Um, encourage people as much as we can to do that because it's it's hard when it doesn't happen you know it's also one of the only things you can pay for in advance before you go on medicaid you, right yes hey that's good yeah that's impressive yeah th- well thank you i uh, work for a radio station that skews a little bit older so uh, <laughs> yeah but i know that's a huge thing is people said well i can pay for this while i'm still here before right. You know, before money becomes uh, an obligation to my family members for that. Right. And funerals aren't cheap. Right. They're not cheap at all. Um, so let me tell you about an experience I had at your place of business. Okay. That I, and first and foremost, I will say, uh, I'm not going to name them right here just in case they That's don't want to be named. But it is my go-to funeral home in Fargo, <laughs> Moorhead, because I think that you guys do it the best. And I like the Thank people you. who work there. So... We go in and we're planning my mother's funeral. Now, my mother had had a stroke and her brain activity just declined. And we had 20 days from the incident until her passing. And so we had time to start thinking about the things that you need to think about. We had planned my dad's funeral almost 15 years earlier. And we said, well, we're going to go with cremation. And so we're sitting there and we... We said, okay, well, we're going to, you know, it's going to be cremated. We're filling out the paperwork for it. And there's a little part where you have to say whether or not you want somebody present. And so I'm with my sister, my girlfriend, her boyfriend, my three aunts, my mom's best friend. Sound like you just said your girlfriend's boyfriend. My girlfriend's boyfriend. Yeah. I'm in a very <laughs> fluid relationship. Yep. It's open. Uh, <laughs> and so we all said, no, 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 until one person says, well, exactly what does that mean? And I think, why would you even ask that? And they said, okay, well, what you do is you go into this room and there's a closed circuit, te- you know, closed circuit television monitor and you see the body being prepped to, you know, to be burned. And they put, they etch like a number on like a coin and put that on the, the chest. And so you, you know, and then you, you cremate the body and you come out and you verify that the same coin is there. So, you know, you're not getting, you know, a little bit of Harry and a little bit of Tanya and a little and bit of cat. Greg. Yeah. No, no, no. Cause you guys no don't pets. do pets. No pets. I'm, no pets. I, I know that they don't. Yeah. I'm just saying there are always just stories out there. Right. Every once in a while, there's some nefarious person who's running a crematorium that it pops up in the news where they're basically, uh, improperly disposing yeah. of bodies and not running a crematorium. Yeah. But definitely Alex is not yeah. the guy who does that. Right. And that's <laughs> and so and that's part of the thing. That must be why this is offered on there. Yeah, there are people part, out yeah. there who don't trust uh that that thing. So my question is how many people actually take you up on that offer? Is that a regular thing or is it rare that somebody actually wants to watch that closed circuit to just so, verify. Okay, so let's talk about that. So um, the the closed circuit, they, they still have the closed circuit. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be closed circuit. You can be in the room. Um, you can be as, as hands-on with the process as you want. Um, and I... I think it it all depends on how it's presented and how it, how you th- kind of th- how people think about it. Um, I will tell you that I'm uh, in case you haven't picked up on it. I'm a I'm a huge proponent of being as present and and hands on with the process as as you're comfortable because uh, I've seen the value in it. Like it's it's so valuable for people. Some people just don't want anything to do with it. So um, I, I would say you know, probably more often than not, peep family is not coming out there. However, um, the times that families do come out there, uh, it's, I, I can't, I honestly, I can't remember the last time someone said, gosh, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I hadn't mm, come out here. Um, and that's because it's, you know, we're, it, it's part of the process and, and things, things, uh, you know, the, the, the profession has evolved throughout time and our understanding of, of things have evolved throughout time. But, uh, if you think of it as, you know, we're oftentimes we're, if, 
if it's kind of the more traditional where there's a, the body is present and, and in a casket and then buried, well, we're as a community, we're bringing that body out to its final resting place at the cemetery. It's a, it's a huge thing. It's an undertake. It's a, per, there's a procession and there's flashing lights and cars are driving by and people pay their respects. Um, and it's, that's part of the journey. You know, it's a healing, healing thing to be, you know, as a, as a community carrying that person to their final resting place. And so I think, uh, sometimes coming for the family and friends coming out to the crematory can, can be a similar experience if it's done, you know, if it's done right, or if it's, if it uh, happens that way. And sometimes it's not right. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, but, uh, I, I've always just found it to be a very healing thing. Uh, for people. And so, uh, when we talk about it, I, you know, I don't, I don't push it, but, um, you know, I kind of encourage it sometimes because, you know, just because I've seen it to be a a healing experience, meaningful for people. And so what, what does it look like if you go to the, I mean, it, is it a slab? You don't, is there a you box? You don't see is it's it? it's a, yeah, it's the, so there's, there's a variety of different, uh, what would be termed are called cremation containers. Um, anything from the v- most very basic cardboard or fiberboard box that the body is in to a full blown casket that, that is cremated. That's just, it, it, it's just made out of wood. It's just all made out of wood and the whole thing is cremated, you know, with the body inside of it. So, so it's a variety of different, different containers, if you will, that the body could be in. Um, the the coin or the medallion they actually just set it off to the side right to the side of the remains of the the container um but it's a it's a chamber it's a crematory uh, a retort is the is kind of one of the the terms for it but the cremation chamber uh sometimes we'll have just a little service where we read a few words that we're committing this person to you know the, their final uh final resting place if you you know if you want to say it that way um, and then the, you know, sometimes the family will help us, but the, the, the container that is, that's holding the body, um, is rolled into the, the cremation chamber and the door, the door comes down, uh, and then the, the process starts the, there's, you know, quite a few different, um, buttons to, you know, they have to, it's got a computer in it. So you have to set everything for the cremation process and, and then that starts the, starts the process so how long does it take the cremation process mm-hmm. itself uh anywhere from one to two one to three hours is is wow. kind of typical a, a variety of different circumstances can change that can make that different but um but generally speaking one to three hours is is what that window of time is wow yeah um this is slightly off topic and you tell you just give me the high sign <laughs> if you're like stop talking right now but uh, yeah. there's a a movie called Trilogy of Terror that Camp. came out years ago and there's a Trilogy of Terror 2 and one of the aspects of Trilogy of Terror 2 is a woman who has killed her wealthy husband okay um for for his wealth obviously <laughs> Uh, is very excited and they bury him and she's going for the cheapest area of the cemetery and the the cemetery uh, man says like listen um, I don't suggest that you use the north end of the cemetery you know go down here or she's like no 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 and he goes well okay then you should buy this steel box and it should be a fully you know full cement thing down there and they're like you're just trying to charge us more and they just like oh no you don't understand and what it is, is oh, no. it turns out that her husband was buried wearing like a ring that had like a microfiche with all of the passwords for his bank accounts. And so they need to go dig up his body. And the reason why this gentleman in the cemetery said don't bury him in the north end <laughs> is they have these giant underground rats. That's like the R-O-U-S's from oh, Princess what? Bride. This is a different direction than I thought yeah. was happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, I pet cemetery so they, <laughs> they dig. They dig down, and because they didn't use this steel case or c- cover it you know, in cement, these rats have dug into the coffin and have pulled like the body down yeah. like one of their tunnels, and so she so follows it's it. It's very like claustrophobic because she gets in there, and then she, she gets lost. It. Yeah, because she wants the money so bad. Oh, yeah. I feel like if you watched that, you'd have a deeper appreciation for it than I do in just a different way. Wow. 
But so th- so <laughs> this amazing. is my next question. I thought it was going to be like I don't go up that road. Yeah. So not, is that not, real? Not there. Yeah. Does that um, happen? The, I, well, I, the soil of a man's I, heart. I, I don't want to theorize that the reason we haven't had a zombie apocalypse is because of our nation's undertakers. Oh man. The embalming process the makes Lord. them yep. makes it unable to to for the for the the dead to walk again. Preventing the zombie apocalypse <laughs> since 1920. <laughs> Do you have a piece of uh, popular media that you enjoy the most that involves funerals or undertaking or zombieism for that fact? Oh, my. Wow, that's... I know it's, a, it's interesting a, because we're really obsessed with it right now. Yeah, well, how many people will say to you, have you seen Six Feet Under? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? That's yeah. everyone. Yeah. Or My Girl. My Girl. Um, Not My Girl too, because all they do is ship her out to L.A., Right. That's really, you know, lazy parenting. Or that scene yeah. in Home Alone when John Candy is talking about leaving his son in a funeral home for the weekend. Which yeah. is improvised, by the way. Really? If you watch oh, Catherine wow. O'Hara during that scene, <clears throat> she is trying so hard to keep herself from laughing, and you see her, like, biting her own lip. Catherine O'Hara <laughs> was in my dream last night. <laughs> oh, we'll get, we'll we get to really, that. Oh, we'll get great. to that in a minute. It's <laughs> a um, good tie-in. But, I mean, is there is there anything out there that you either feel is... You, really close to uh, to something that you do or oh, gosh. that you just think is so funny because there must be somebody who had a relative or a little piece of inside information so they you know they knew this process inside and out for example another thing is um there's a movie that came out not too long ago called Death at a Funeral. There's a British mm, version yes. uh. and then there was an American version like 6 months later. Um Alan Tudyk, right? Yeah, uh, he was in the uh, Frank Oz directed. Yeah, it. yep, yep. I am trying to think. And Peter Seen Dinklage was in both. Yep, <laughs> that's right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Playing the same character. <laughs> yep. But I always kind of felt like whoever wrote that had obviously, oh my gosh, been to a been real to family funeral. It. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Nothing, nothing. You know, comes to my mind when you say that. But I, yeah, so we I haven't gotten those. it quite right then, huh? No, I not even the end of Return of the Jedi when he. Sets when he has his, his own father tire. flame. Oh, jeez. What? Yeah. It, so here's a, a legitimate question, actually. As as you've been Excuse talking, me? from me. Oh, okay. I was you're, say, you're like, my questions are all legitimate. Uh, I just, yeah, I, mine are not. <laughs> here's one that is legitimate. <laughs> well, here's one that is not a flight of fancy. Uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about the various ways that other peoples and cultures, and even in history have gone through the funeral process. Mm-hmm. And when you're even talking about embalming, I'm thinking about Egypt, right? When they had this process where they would empty the organs from the body and things like right. that. So as it, along the, the path to being an undertaker, did you even just intellectually study how other cultures view this process? Like, was that part of your interest or were you merely interested in this sort of this particular task in this particular way? That is part of, uh, you know, we certainly have to look at that, you know, the history of funeral service. I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the courses that we, we take and, and, uh, and it's an important thing for, for us to understand the evolution of, of the funeral, you know, what that is. And, um, so yeah, we, we, we study that, um, uh, the, what was the second part of your question? I just got totally sidetracked. No, no, it was just a few other cultures. Or, or, were, were, you cultures. At, were you actually oh, what interested led me? in that? Was yeah. I interested in that? Yes, I, I was interested, that, interested in that, but more than that, um, what what led me into this profession um, was the was I, I saw I saw the importance of what was taking place, the the gravity of it. Like the care it's caring you know it's caring for the community you know we're caring for the members of the community it's, it's such an important job um profession thing to undertake and and you know what a better way of caring for people caring for a community than being able to care for the dead you know care for the 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 people that have died and and so that that more than anything i think to me um, was was what attracted me or drew me into this. It was I I should say it was not uh, it wasn't something where I really studied it and thought you know I think I'm gonna go in that direction. Mm. It found me. I I was not. Uh, it kind of it, it it found me for sure. I was not looking for it. Um, 
I it was it was a random. I was I was at Saint Olaf. I was I was an yeah. orchestra. You know, like you were talking about the music thing. You know, yeah. I, it was always kind of this assumed thing, and I even assumed it like, well, I suppose I'll go into music as a career because it's the one thing I'm good at. Um, You're not just good at it, and, and this is not hyperbole. I mean, Alex is world class. He's oh, that's, amazing. He was amazing in high school, and some of the best. Some of my best memories from doing music in high school was listening to you and Sam Martin just jam. Oh, so Sam, Sam Martin, Martin, who's a, a brilliant, beautiful bass singer, but amazing. also uh, uh, he would play <clears throat> harmonica, uh, who's also was also brilliant. Mm -hmm. And these two would, from time to time, they would just improvise, and it would be gorgeous. So it, it, that's one of the very interesting things about Alex is that he has as part of his life as profession, which we would all find. Uh, dark maybe morbid or whatever but the other half of him is is like just i'd say pure joy it's just beautiful mm -hmm. and you do you still play with pachin oh yeah 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 so you've the probably been pachin you've yeah. probably heard alex play in town before if you visited any bar do either aspects of those overlap in any way oh yes absolutely you know i think the 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 healing um properties of music uh are play completely play into the way i see my role as a funeral director um and having done this for 11 years now i end up playing violin at a lot of funerals um because there's, there's something about I'll, I'll i'll admit i mean there's something about the sound of a violin um it just can be this guttural beautiful raw um you know emotion that that can come from it and and um so i've had the opportunity and and it's and it's just if people you know i grew up around here it's just if people request it i i will do everything i can in my willpower to to make it happen and and play at a service and obviously i'm usually there so um so i make it happen but um i i love it because it's it's a gift i can i can also give you know to the family to just have this reflective time um, but music, I mean, you know, when was the last time you were at a funeral where there was no music? I mean, music is a part of it. Music is a part of life and it's, it's emotion and it's, it's ways of expressing things, whether it's lyrically or, uh, just instrumentally, you know, through melody, um, it can bring so much emotion. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a pure joy of mine to, to when those two meet, when I get to join those two, um, I, I absolutely love it. I agree that I think music is one of those aspects of a funeral that really either uh, I, th I think indicate that the family knew the person or that they did not know the person. Because I've been <laughs> yeah. to some funerals yeah. where they make some choices and I go, boy, Whoa. <laughs> I don't think that Beth Ann would really have dug this so much. Right. But then you go to another one. I heard a rendition of Norwegian Wood at a oh. funeral once that was out of this world and they oh kind of gosh. slowed it down. Didn't the Jurassic Park theme play at uh, at Jared's? It sure did. I, that, was that was a perfect. choice I made. That right was there. beautiful. Awesome. And I remember it was, I believe it was in the pre-service uh -huh. music. And I remember when that came on and th there was a crowd reaction from everyone because mm -hmm. we totally got why this one was there. It was not superfluous. It was very much a... Well, a life song. finds a way. So, yeah, That's exactly. So exactly. Cool. Yeah. Um, wow. I my, want the X Men animated series theme at mine. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm I'm taking I'll, I'm taking that to heart right now. Please Tucker. do. So I'm, I'll remember that. Um, <coughs> at my dad's funeral, uh, we we had a family friend named Matt Valine who is one of does one of the best renditions of the Lord's Prayer I've ever heard. Mm. Lee Massey <coughs> on the piano and Matt. Oh wow. Uh, sings it. It's just very powerful and it's. Amazing because I've heard it at weddings, I've heard it at funerals, and it kind of works for both. both yeah. Um, but then they also did "The River" by Garth Brooks. Oh wow! And so now, whenever I hear that song, it really brings up a deep emotion. And my person, the my here's my main jam is so my family is very heavy Scottish, okay. and so Dan Aird from the mm -hmm. Heather and Thistle Bagpipes uh, oh, yeah. organization. Uh, I've been to several funerals where he pipes Amazing Grace on the way out, and hearing that in an old like gothic cathedral, there is a power to that. And talk about a healing process. Mm -hmm. 
it's almost like it's sucking the air out of the room so that you've got that last gasp of like, okay, and then it oh, either yeah. floods you with emotion or it cleanses you of you know of that sadness and you realize that life still goes on. Another personal favorite of mine to get into funeral music is the parting glass. Mm. Oh yes. Uh, the specifically the one from the Waking <laughs> Ned Divine soundtrack yep. that Sean Davy does, I think is so fitting and there's so much to it. Let's the Irish really know how to do a funeral, yes. right? I mean Amen. they really have figured that mm-hmm. out. When you're stuck on an island, Amen. I mean there's not yeah. many things you can really <laughs> perfect and dealing with the dead bodies has got to be one of them. It's like, you know, yeah, well, we might as well drink while we're all here, yeah. right? <laughs> you know? I mean, we're all here. We might as well have a good time. Uh, is there do, – do people ever ask for advice if they're giving a eulogy and just think, you know, I know I need to say something about the person, but I'm also – speaking to the crowd you know i'm speaking to the right. group of people here i'm the representative who's trying to bring something personal as far as a touch mm-hmm. um do they ever ask for <clears throat> ad- advice or i wish more did yeah to be honest but I, it, only because there's you know there's so many good resources out there for people and and i think sometimes it's well you know am i gonna just should i just get up there and do some storytelling um you know understanding uh and 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 searching for you know finding what it is your goal is because because certain you know some people have different goals for a eulogy yep um it can mean many different things you know there's there's situations where they need to they need to talk about something there's there's something that's you know that's that's buried or that's a secret or that everyone you know the elephant in the room kind of thing there's situations like that where the you they they feel like that's that's what they need to talk about in that moment or or they're led to. Um, and other times it's it's more kind of your your classic or your typical eulogy where you know they're they're sharing with their friends kind of on behalf of the family um, just a message from the family of you know this is thank you so much for being here and and you know this is what th- this person meant to us and I know this is what they meant to you and tell a few stories and things. Um you know, I, I know you were talking in in the episode when you were uh, talking with Adam Martin. You were talking about how you've you've shared at a few funerals and things like mm-hmm. that, and and um, and you know, I think that's th- there's many different ways to go go about it, um, and just have just having a, a framework and and kind of that reflective time of what is what does this mean? What does this mean to me? What am I trying to express? through this, you know, as opposed to just kind of writing and, and things like that. So I think there's a lot of good guidance. Um, you know, so yes, yeah, sometimes they definitely do are coming to us. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it's whoever is maybe officiating the service. That's having that conversation more, um, with people, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see what, uh, what people come up with. When uh, when my grandmother died, she died on Christmas, which was very fitting for her because she loved attention. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the day of her funeral, the funeral was set to be at the First Presbyterian Church downtown, and then they had to close down the federal building because of the bomb ha- scare. Yeah, bomb oh, no. scare. Oh, great. And so it was Jeez. it was amazing. Yeah. An- another shout out to your business because <laughs> they were the ones handling the arrangements, and they said. Listen, Listen, we're going to put this into the chapel we have on site, and we will have someone there who will just be directing traffic. And so they're like, no, 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 no. We moved. We moved. Yeah. We moved. We moved. I remember and hearing then, about that. Did, oh, really? Oh, see, oh, yeah. My grandma loved There's attention. There's a story she, about it. Yeah. She would have yeah. eaten every minute of that up. Um, she probably called in the bomb scare. Probably. Yeah. That was probably her last wish. Yeah, she, <laughs> she she put that like in her will to her lawyer. In a little letter. <laughs> was yeah. like, do this for me. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I am one of those people who my favorite funerals are the ones I walk away from laughing. And I love the opportunity to share memories with people and to think of those moments in life that made you – love that person or I, I had an obituary for my friend um, <clears throat> and I stood up there and it was at a Mormon church and they were very nervous because it was out, it was down in Utah. I had never met anyone from this church in particular Okay, and they were worried that I was going to be wild and I was going to say something inappropriate. 
but my opening line was, uh, Dustin Buchanan was the most frustrating person I ever met in my entire <laughs> life. And it set a tone that I really loved because I think a lot of people who were there speaking for him didn't know him for a long time. But if you can find a universal aspect of somebody, yep. that's what and that's what they're looking for. And right. I don't think they're looking for you to to, you know, turn them into a saint. And there's that feeling of you do know him. He was here. He was a part of your yeah. life because you're saying something that is true. Um, and I mean, there are other nice things that could be said about Dustin, who I knew as well, like how funny he was and stuff like that. But I think that was probably the truest thing you could start with, mm-hmm. with that yeah, guy. Absolutely. And it, and it shows. He would have agreed, too. Yeah. yeah. He would have yeah. agreed. <laughs> he would have started doing that bird no, laugh. No. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. He would have flipped you off. Yep, exactly. Which was, by the way, after he passed, I was looking through my photos of Dustin. I don't have a photo of Dustin where he's not flipping the bird. So I couldn't, oh, funny. I couldn't post one on Facebook. Yeah. So I was like, I don't have one I can post. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to, I was just, I, literally, I was as you were talking about that, I was visualizing, like, it's a way of find, finding a way to express how he touched everyone in this, in this room. Because, and it, you know, it, a funeral brings people together anyway. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, 200 people out there and you, you, everyone's probably wondering like, God, I wonder how he, you know, touched these lives. And so if you can bring, bring that, you know, words to that, I, I think that's just so, so cool. You know, if, when a, when a eulogy can do that, it brings everyone. It's like, yes, yes, that we all have that in common. I have had two things I've set down for my funeral that my sister and some of my friends know. So Hopefully they'll push it. And one is I want uh, the little Spanish flea to be played by a single trumpet. (laughs) Uh, Because I think people will go like, what is going on? Uh, But I want my eulogy delivered by a Muppet that looks like me. So, you know. The Muppet actually already exists. Really? Yeah. Yeah, It's already been created and it's ready to go. Um, (laughs) So I just feel there there are certain aspects where. A, f- a funeral, while it isn't a final, it's not like this is the last time you're ever going to talk about this person, mm-hmm. and you know this is us closing the book on them. Right. But it is that time where you say like this is a time to remember that person and celebrate that person. Um, I think of some of the benchmark funerals that I've heard about mm-hmm. in history. Andy Kaufman has yep. got one of them. Yep. Um, Jim Henson's funerals. Once a year, you can watch his New York memorial on YouTube, and oh, yeah. it is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. Because uh, the big no, bird, b- yeah. when Big Bird oh, comes out and God. says yeah. it's not easy being green, and dedicates it to Kermit. Oh. Um, oh, that's yeah, I, know. Sad to yeah. about I know, me too. Um, <laughs> I love oh. the fact that no one was allowed to wear black. They mm-hmm. made all of those little butterfly puppets for people to <laughs> hold in the audience, but. There are just amazing moments out there that, yeah. and when people think of a funeral, I think their first thought is sadness. Right. And it's hard because it should be celebration. And the celebration can be sadness mm-hmm. or it can be longing. It can be happiness. I even think in celebration, you can celebrate the regret mm-hmm. of not having more time with this person. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But so, uh, Let's get let's get back slightly to the professional aspect of it. How many suits do you have that are just like black as night, or is wearing black not something a funeral director does, and they're trying to bring another color into it? I still wear black, yeah. Um, but I also I I have a variety also, you know, uh, generally dark, <laughs> yeah, generally darker, and um. You know, it's uh, uh, out of, certainly out of uniformity, but it's funny that you say that because uh, you know, I, I, people will mention to me once in a while when I wear my like my gray suit, like God, that's really nice. You know, it's kind of uplifting. It's light. You know, it's a little lighter than black, but um, you know, certainly I, I guess the formality of it, um, and always, you know, I always want to make sure I'm conveying uh, that that dignified respect that I think everyone deserves. Um, and so uh, for me, crisp black, you know, does it, it just, it just best conveys that to me, but, um, you know, just having a polished, uh, you know, look, I guess, um, also, 
uh, can do the same thing. So, do you yeah. ever? Does it ever feel uh, spooky to you, like when you're around, you know, uh, the 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 bodies, the remains of people, and then you hear a creak somewhere? Or has this become now down to a part of where it's science to you? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily down to science. It is a, it's kind of a way of life, and it's something that I've, uh, I've been comfortable with. I've found comfort in, and um, you know, there's there's definitely been situations where, yeah, you know, I might, of course, if I'm at a funeral home, I could have bodies. Uh, of of people around me and people who have died um but you know hearing a little noise here and there doesn't doesn't necessarily bother me because I've been around it for so long and and I'm seeing it as as the uh you know to go back to that term the undertaking as it is we're caring you know we're serving the living by caring for the dead is one of the, the my favorite kind of ways of putting putting it but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a task we're, we're, um, we're caring for their bodies. And so it's, I I think no different than probably, uh, you know, a person that's working at a hospital and has a patient that's on the table and, and it's really intense, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm in the moment. I mean, I'm caring for them, uh, as I would care for my family. And so, you know, to hear little sounds or spooky. I, I wouldn't say I've really had that a spooky situation because I feel like it's such a, I don't know, I feel like it's a blessed opportunity to to be in that situation. You know, people are trusting their loved ones to us. And so it's, um, I don't know, I just feel, I think I feel really good about it as, as opposed to, you know, having a, a spooky thought here and there. There are things that Hollywood does not prepare you for when mm-hmm. you're around your first dead body. Yep. Um, both my parents passed in my house, uh, both under hospice care. Okay. And I remember when my dad passed, boy, oh boy, you know, the, the day of we knew we heard that death rattle that mm-hmm. you'll hear people talk about, which is kind of this gurgling in the lungs. And so people started coming during the day to, you know, say goodbye and, at the end of the day, finally, the last guests had left. We all, my mother and my uh, sister and I were down in the living room. We were just having five minutes to ourselves to say, oh, you know, we had so many guests today. Yeah. And my dad took that brief time when there was nobody there to go out on his own, which mm. is very much, I think, my dad's MO of like, just get the circus out of here yeah. and let me be on let my own. Be, yeah, absolutely. But I always thought that you, it's, you know, you can close someone's eyes really easily, but it we had to massage the muscle around the eyelid. The way they show it in movies of someone just like touching oh, yeah. the eyelid and just you know closing them like that doesn't yeah, exist. I, I don't know why <laughs> I don't know why they real. still do that in movies because yeah, there's a universal reaction of yeah. <laughs> that's not how that goes. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Everyone, yeah. five year olds are like, yeah. uh, doesn't pass uh-huh. the smell test to me there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I remember why do they still my, do that? My grandmother hugging my dad, and then. We thought he was alive again because we heard like, <sighs> but it was just the air, the air being pressed sure. out of his lungs. And there are just things that I think a lot of people realize about death once they are around it. But unless, and there are people who go their whole lives with never being in the, a room with someone as they pass. Yeah. And it is powerful. And it, watching someone take their last, you never really know when it's their last breath right. until l- like After, later. Yep. Yeah. Um, and even then, sometimes, you know, 45 seconds will go by and you'll be like, okay. And then all of a sudden, <gasps> and you go, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Everyone, back to one. It back to one. Everybody. While, yep. Um, yep. And so is it must be, do, do people ever come to you for advice you know we obviously your the your big show takes place after the passing right but so much starts before the actual passing gets to be a part of it mm-hmm. um you know we talked about pre-planning funerals right. uh going into that but when someone is on hospice care do people call you in advance and say 
and kind of look for guidance and say like, well, we know it's going to happen. We don't know when, Mm -hmm. but what do we need to do? What should we be looking forward to? Right. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. A lot of people will call We do get a lot of, you know, phone calls and, and communications at that point in time. And a lot of times, and I think it's human nature. It's like you said, what, what can we be doing? What should we be doing? Um, and especially when, when it's in that, that, near death you know the they know it's coming soon um the the tendency for people is to want to i want to do something be a busybody you know i want to be productive um because i feel like you know we're just maybe we're just sitting around or whatever um but oftentimes what my advice is at that point in time is spend time with them spend that time because you're you have one opportunity right now to be spending just quality uh you know if you're oftentimes you're just sitting at the bedside but that you only have one chance at this and you know yeah you could be writing an obituary and looking for pictures and picking music and things like that that's okay we'll get to that we we plan we plan out funerals uh when there's been no pre-planning done after a death takes place all the time it's it, we are we are able to do it and it and we can walk you through that process but you know being present being present in that time i think is so important i think that's the most one of the most important things not just before the death but after the death is just being present being aware um and and experiencing that because you it, it's one of those things you have one shot at doing it you know Um, and so that's always my, that's kind of my advice when people call at that time is, you know, be present. Um, don't think about, don't think too far in advance, you know, past the death and things like that. We'll handle, we'll help, help you out when that time comes, just be, be present and, you know, they need somebody with them right now. So yeah, that's. I walk into like businesses like sawmills. (laughs) that have modern technology and then, but they still have the old handsaw up on the wall or you walk into some place that makes wine and they have the old grape press in the corner. Do you in your office have one of those old sticks (laughs) that they used to use to measure the size of the coffin? Like, is that something that people put on their walls (laughs) in funeral homes? I'm glad they got a laugh out of you too. Maybe some funeral homes. I don't have one of those sticks hanging Mm, above my desk. Christmas is right around the corner. I I do have, I I should say, I do have a funny... For the undertaker in your life. Yeah, it's not sitting on my desk because I just feel a little weird about it. But I I have a gavel because I'm the president of the the State Funeral Directors Association Mm. right now. And so there's a gavel with that. Which Those parties must be pretty lively. <laughs> yes, lively. Mm-hmm. Hey, I know it uh, must be really easy to write your newsletter, huh? Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, do you use that for uh, when you preside, like over you know minutes? I don't and stuff even like know that? where to set it because it just feels so. I, I don't know. I just feel feel like it's a little arrogant. You know, I, I'm name, just like you know, for me. You know, it's I, I I keep it in a play. You know, tucked away and and uh, have it there. No, that's just kind of one of those funny things. But we have we have old uh, kind of antique like embalming equipment that's kind of neat. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. It's not out on display. Well, I would but, hope I mean, not. We but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, you know, it's kind of just for us to. Enjoy seeing, I guess, and remember where you came from. Remember where right? you came, and we have an old printing press, you know, because we oh we, from the programs, we, yeah, from the oh. programs, cool, like old school, man, like yeah. An old, yeah I suppose cool. there had to be somebody at one point who, you know, had to put the typeset together, yep. and pe- we've got or, all that stuff. I mean, how really? are you supposed to make yeah. your slideshow in the 1930s? Like, what That's software were they even using? You know them? what they used to do though? They used to have a camera set up where the camera would be on like a tripod facing down. And you'd put a picture underneath it, huh. and then and the camera and I don't know I don't know how it worked, but it was crazy. Huh. They oh, used like to, a video camera, a video, and then yeah, like, you'd make like a VHS video wow. tribute. Wow! And even that. So there is the the business of death is amazing to me mm-hmm. because I know people who uh, their side hustle is making uh, uh, photo collages sure. or creating things in a very short amount of time right. so you know your deadline again no pun intended here it must be really great to write oh, that newsletter huh? there's a yeah. website That's... you go to i know there is <laughs> um but 
even that is is amazing. I love sub economies. I love things that exist that you don't really realize are we had to think of yeah right we had a gentleman in here who's selling toys from the 1980s for the nostalgic factor and he's getting 10 times what <laughs> what people oh paid gosh. for them when they originally bought them it's awesome um, but and there are, there are all sorts of things you know i talked about dan aired you know mm-hmm. that is a side business Absolutely. for dan you know and it's it's not free when you ask him to come and play amazing grace and um it is. It just intrigues me so much that there are people out there who have made a professional life around whether it's around uh, like a wedding, the beginning of a new life, or at the end of a life. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the coolest thing you've ever seen at a funeral where you were like, "Got to jot that one down for m- my book for my eventual wishes." Oh man! Wow, that's. Um... I gotta think on that here. Something skateboard related, maybe. <clears throat> skateboard related. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, there's God. There's so many different uh, different great things that that uh, that people do with uh, with services and and uh, hmm. Heat of the moment. I'm just trying to think. You no, know, like Hunter S. Thompson, like getting shot out of a cannon. Oh my gosh. Kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, that's that's uh <laughs> I Okay, so here's a question. Yeah. So uh what what's the legality of releasing obviously a person can't have the body back, but you can have the cremated, cremated remains. remains. So what happen I mean, what happens if somebody wants the body? The actual body? Yeah. Um that's got to be a health Code that oh, right? can't be legal. I would assume. Yeah, no, <clears throat> no, that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be legal. And I'd certainly, uh, you know, I'd have to look through the century code to find the exact. But I mean, you know, the the uh, the state has regulations as far as you know how long a body can be kept around before being either buried or cremated. You know, um, and so there's regulations with that. That so that's uh, that's that's an interesting. I'm, I'm just picturing that conversation, like, and where would you like your mother to be interred? Yeah, I'll just take her. But I mean, people can <laughs> right. Well, okay, people like, can bury at home though, right? You know, yeah, they, like on the sure. family farm. On the family farm, you have to designate wherever they are as a as a cemetery. You have to have it, have it designated really? as a cemetery. Yep, whatever the the you know, it could be just a a four by you know four by eight chunk of land, but it's got to be designated as a cemetery and. Um, so I mean, that's that's certainly something that's been done, and and that's pretty cool. You know that. Uh, you know, you got to think through long, long term. You know how how does that how does this all play out, if you will? You know, Tucker and I went to a cemetery in Kentucky when we were visiting his grandmother. That goes back even pre Civil War. Mm-hmm. That was one of the most awe inspiring places I've ever been to. And when you considering the consider the fact that they made some of these monuments before even pneumatic tools mm-hmm. were an option, it is incredibly impressive. And it just goes to show that the creation of memories and the wanting for a place to associate with that loved one mm-hmm. is pretty amazing and impressive too. Yep. Um, look at what they're doing with laser etching on headstones nowadays. Oh, yeah. There's. I was just <laughs> in a cemetery recently where they had one that looked like the guy's face, and he was riding a motorcycle. Oh sure, yep. And I thought that is pretty cool. That yep. totally mm-hmm. sums up, you know. I don't know, if, you know, like Meathead or whatever his right. name. He yeah. had like a quote nickname on there, yeah. but I didn't catch yeah. it. The, the Lexington Cemetery did make me does make me wish that getting a crypt was still like an option because that's so it was so old. There are certain areas that they would carve out the side of a hill, and it's literally like a room you could walk in that's then barred, and and that's like you have like your own hillside that's chained forever and like you are in there in a in a sarcophagus of some kind sure. in a room of some kind mm-hmm. well that i mean mausoleum is still mausoleum a thing, right still yeah there's a mausoleum there's a mausoleum in town i've been to the mausoleum yeah. in town but yeah. i'm thinking more like 
No, I want to be buried one... like a like a like a pharaoh almost, you yeah. know, into the yeah. side of a hill. And, Epic. Yeah, and and if there if someone were to break in, there'd be like an electronic message, then a hologram that would pop up and be like, "If you are the one who has broken into my grave, you get <laughs> my treasure." Congratulations! <laughs> yeah. Congratulations! Yeah, that's a very humble. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that cemetery is interesting too. It's split into one side is Protestant, the other side is Catholic. Yeah, and there are graves there with tiny graves right behind them, and I asked. One of the caretakers, like, are those children or what is that? They said, nope, those are slaves. Those uh, some some people in the South, when they died, um, they would have a spot set for their slave to be buried right next to them. Mm-hmm. But the gravestones were tiny and, and unmarked, no names or anything on them, and hmm. it's all over that cemetery. It's, it's really interesting. And there are gravestones that you just can't read anymore. They just you can't read them anymore because they weren't made of marble. They were made of stone. And it's already been weathered away, and algae's growing all over it. And it's weird to think that those are people that there's there there's no one even alive now who probably knew that person. Like that that person is gone, gone. The mm-hmm. memories of them are gone, and this unreadable gravestone is what is left. Anyways, that's a good way to take this conversation. I think it's, well, yeah, yeah, right. It's great. It's a great way to go with this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't have an end to my uh, rant, so I had to say, wow, I did a good job well, just now. I, <laughs> that's good. When I was in my early 20s, I wanted to buy a parcel of land south of town and start a cemetery because I thought that there's probably always money in a cemetery. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Especially if you find a nice there's part tons. of land that's well taken oh. care of. There's always money in the cemetery. I mean, I think that there is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there there is. It's something that people need and- it's something that they look for, and you look. But at you're like, not getting monthly payments for the no, for the rent. No, yeah, you get a one time. You get like a one, yeah. You, you got to think about that. I, oh, trust Just me, saying. I I had a lot of thoughts <laughs> put into this thing. I was like, well, how many how many gravesites do I need charge before monthly I'm... rent? <laughs> <laughs> See maybe, how that goes. Maybe it's a la carte, right? Be like. This is called our flowers yeah. package, and uh, this one is called the uh, deer yeah. package. I've got to get a second job. <laughs> Nana's about to be evicted from her grave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alex, thanks so much for coming uh, on the JJ Meets World. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. This was this was awesome. I, I had no idea what direction we were going to go, but I just. You know, I I'm passionate about funeral service, and I love talking about what what we do and and the importance of it. And it was it was a lot of fun talking with you guys. We'd love what? to get more members of Pachin in too at some yeah, point. Maybe talk about that at some point in the future. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, what if someone out there wants to get into the world of being a funeral director? Do you have any advice for the young give ones? Give me a call. Uh, give me a call, and let's talk about it. You know, it's a it's a uh, it's a it's an amazing profession. It's one that's been around for, it's one of the oldest professions around. And, and, uh, yeah, I would love to talk to him. So, you know, contact, take a look at our website, hansonrunsvold.com. Um, or just, or there's a lot of good resources out there. The national funeral directors association, um, has a lot of good resources for people that are thinking about getting into the funeral profession. Um, it's, it's some honorable work, you know, we're caring, we're, we're serving communities, we're serving people by caring for the dead and, um, that's a that's a pretty uh, pretty awesome thing. Pretty cool to to do. So. You guys are undertaking a pretty yeah. important project. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Good. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for being here. Absolutely. JJ meets world. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode, folks. We need your help to keep the lights on. Patreon dot com slash JJ meets world. If you can donate a couple of bucks once or set up a reoccurring monthly donation, we really appreciate it. We don't have fancy tote bags. We are not PBS. We don't have a Mr. Rogers who will go and sit before a Senate committee and beg on our behalf. The best we can do is Tucker writing you a note to say thank you, but it's going to be on the back of a fast food wrapper at best. So help us along here, folks, patreon.com slash JJ Meets World, or you can go to our website, jjmeetsworld.com, and find the Patreon page link through there. 
even a dollar makes a difference. Two dollars makes a difference. If you can give us twenty dollars a month, that's even better. And thank you so much to the people who are contributing this right away. We're thinking of ways that we can reward you. I don't know what that's going to be. Maybe specialty episodes for subscribers alone. Um, one day we want to take the show on the road. So that's how this is going to get happen. It's how we're going to make things bigger and better. And before you ask, no. We cannot get a bank loan for this. We have asked several institutions, and none of them seem to be behind this. If you would like to catch up on previous episodes of JJ Meets World, go to our website, jjmeetsworld.com, or you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you're consuming the podcast that you love, and watch or listen to the old episodes. You can also rate some of these episodes. We appreciate a nice high rating. Special thanks to those of you who've given us a five star or a five star and then a great comment below that. Those things go a long way as well. If you've given us a one star rating, why are you still listening? Give up on us already. There's many other podcasts that you will enjoy more. And last but certainly not least, how to get a hold of us. You can go to moonbasemaria.com and check out all the great things that my producer Tucker Lucas has done and will be doing in the future. You can go to linebenders.com and you can uh, find the contact info for myself, JJ Gordon. And I don't know why no one's ever thought about this, but pop-up brunch seems to be like a really good idea. And I think it should be called Toastbusters. I ain't afraid of no toast. 